Trump held his rally at Madison Square Garden, and it's hard to ignore the parallels between it and other fascist-style events. In particular, it's been compared by many to the 1939 Pro-America rally held by the German-American Bund, where 20,000 Americans assembled at the same venue to do this. And there were a lot of fascist elements to Trump's rally as well. The opening act featured racist jokes about black, Puerto Rican, and Latino Americans. There were repeated chants of FIGHT! 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 from multiple speakers. And Trump defended his stance of calling opponents enemies from within. None of this helps distance the Trump campaign from its history with fascist imagery and language, like how immigrants live like vermin within the confines of our country. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. Or how a Trump ad featured language referring to a unified Reich. But there's another MSG event that Trump's rally resembles probably even more. 56 years ago, on October 24th, 1968, George Wallace, the presidential candidate running on the Independence Party ticket, took the stage at Madison Square Garden. Above any other candidate, Wallace is probably the closest analog to Trump in American history. Some have been making this comparison since as far back as 2016, when Trump's brash and openly hostile brand of politics turned everything we expect about an election on its head. Wallace, like Trump, capitalized on separating true Americans, in his case, white, from the other running an explicitly segregationist campaign. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Because this country is not He personally protested the racial integration at the University of Alabama in 1963, standing in the schoolhouse door and blocking the entrance of Vivian Malone and James Hood to prevent their registration as had been legalized in the decision in Brown v. Board of Education. In 1968, Wallace, like Trump, claimed mainstream media outlets lied about this. When Time Magazine writes that, they told an unmitigated falsehood. Uh, I never made any such statement, and I've never run on a segregation uh, platform uh, throughout the country. I've never said that you should have segregation of the school system or any other. In fact, we don't have segregation in Alabama. We've had more mixing and mingling among people of both races in Alabama than they've had in New York State, where you come from. Wallace railed against elites and how their permissive stance on free speech on college campuses was anti-American. But we have the elite cult and the intellectual incompetence who say, but governor, what about the right of dissent? What about freedom of speech? What about the Constitution? And I pulled the Constitution out and said, you read what it says about treason. It says giving overt aid and comfort to the enemy. It's very plain. And I said, if you can't distinguish at Harvard between honest dissent and overt acts of treason, then you ought to come on down to Alabama and we'll teach you some law down there. Cause y'all don't know some of you Wallace was famous for speaking at boisterous rallies, which on at least one occasion turned violent. When four white men were arrested for beating three black attendees with metal folding chairs. Seems a bit familiar, right? 56 years later at Madison Square Garden, Trump channeled Wallace's spirit via his politics of rage and racism. From the same stage where Wallace proclaimed, anarchy prevails today in the streets of the large cities of our country, Trump promised to rescue every city and town that has been invaded and conquered, and we will put these vicious and bloodthirsty criminals in jail. We're gonna kick them the hell out of our country as fast as possible. Wallace lashed out at his opponents and said, liberals and the left-wingers have brought us to the domestic mess we're in now. A massive, vicious, crooked, radical left machine runs today's Democrat Party. Wallace played his hit, 
opposition to school integration, saying, the theoreticians and the pseudo-intellectuals have just about destroyed not only local government, but the school systems of our country. While Trump said, We will get critical race theory and transgender insanity the hell out of our schools. Wallace said, We are going to turn back to you, the people of the states, the right to control our domestic institutions. With your vote in this election, you can show them once and for all that this nation does not belong to them. This nation belongs to you. It belongs to you. Just two weeks later, Wallace failed to win the presidency, winning only the electoral votes of five Southern states and 13 and a half percent of the popular vote. While he personally didn't have any more success nationally as a politician, his populist, racism-fueled brand of right-wing politics were absorbed into the Republican Party over the course of the next several years. As the major party's followings realigned, the GOP's Southern strategy sought to shore up strength in states Wallace had previously carried. Politicians of Wallace's ilk, now a part of the Republican base, were held at bay for years, unable to ascend to the commanding heights of influence until Trump animated them in 2016, when his victory allowed them to fully take over the party. Knowing all of this, it would be easy to say, see, comparing Trump to a Nazi is a reach. It's not the most apt comparison. But I don't think that's the lesson we should be taking from this. It's not a either or situation. Trump strikingly resembles an avowed segregationist, but segregationists like Wallace also had ties with Nazis. Even though Wallace denounced the Ku Klux Klan in 1958, his famous Segregation Forever speech was written by KKK organizer Asa Carter. Prior to Wallace launching his presidential bid in 1968, Carter assembled a meeting of advisors from the White Citizens Council, John Birch Society, and more Holocaust-denying white supremacist groups to determine how they would prepare for the race and support Wallace. This included Will Cardo, who founded the National Youth Alliance, which would become the National Alliance, a group the Southern Poverty Law Center called the best financed and best organized white nationalist organization of its kind in the United States, launched by Turner Diaries author William Luther Pierce. There's a direct line from Nazis to American segregationists to Donald Trump. They all exist as part of the same ideological lineage. While Trump may not be calling for genocide, he has repeatedly offered support for all the pale shades in the white supremacist gradient, from the thinly veiled but politely excused to overt white nationalists like Nick Fuentes, Steve Bannon, and Stephen Miller. These fascist ideas are part of the same family, one antithetical to the liberal ideals of plurality and equality. And we should remember, unlike Wallace, Trump is not some rogue third-party candidate. He has captured one of the major political parties of the United States and transformed it into a cult of personality driven by rage and hate. As Wallace's rhetoric rises again, we're reminded that democracy isn't guaranteed. It's defended. Letting fear and exclusion take root will cost us dearly, threatening to turn history's painful lessons into tomorrow's reality. <laughs>